Hey guys, this is Joshua Depth Tape Channel, and this is Diesel Engines 101 Fuel Systems. Now, originally when I made our Diesel 101 engine series, I said we we're going to be covering fuel systems. We covered the crankshaft, the cylinder, the valve train, the cooling system, the oil system, but I never made a fuel systems class, and it's kind of been on the back burner. Now, the reason I never got to that is because the fuel system should probably be the last segment on the diesel engine because it is by far the most complicated system in the diesel engine. Probably not going to cover everything in the diesel fuel system in one video, so this will be the first of the videos covering the fuel system. So hopefully you will stick around for them, and hopefully they are high energy, and hopefully they teach you something, okay? Enough jibber-jabbering, let's get into the topic. Okay, so since this is a class, we have a whiteboard. Now... Previous videos, I'd use pictures and videos from stuff I'd actually done. I'm going to still be doing that in this video. But instead of the little animations of me just waving my hands around a lot, I'm going to be trying to relay topics on the whiteboard, which is why I bought the whiteboard. Also bought a lapel mic, so the audio is going to sound a little different than when I'm sitting down because they're different microphones. That's just how it is. So, whiteboard is going to be basically our imagination. Now, I'm assuming, and if you haven't yet, you need to understand how the basics of a diesel engine work. You should watch my Diesel Engine 101 series or figure out how they work some other way before we get into the fuel system because the fuel system is by far the most complicated system on a diesel engine. Now, if you know how a gasoline engine fuel system works, it's much simpler because generally gasoline engines, at least in the past, they would mix the air and the fuel before it got in the cylinder and then ignite it with a spark plug. Well, diesels don't do that. They're what they call compression ignition engines. Which, what does that mean? Well, let's use our whiteboard. So, of course, compression is when the piston goes up and down in the cylinder. We're going to do a cylinder here. Not sure why I drive it too long, but whatever. Now we have a piston moving inside of it. It's moving up in this instance. Piston rings. Whatever. You don't know what a real piston looks like. This is what a real piston looks like. Got pretty close, at least the size. So it's traveling up, right? Which on the compression stroke. This is our cylinder head, which seals off the cylinder. Of course, you have intake and exhaust valves. We'll just do simple renditions of those. So what's happening here? This is the question. So this is air. Remember, we have air on the intake stroke coming into the cylinder. The piston's moving it up. This air is getting compressed, hence compression ignition engine. Now, air will not just explode by itself. Well, maybe it will at a certain temperature. But relatively, the temperatures we're dealing with here are terrestrial. So how much cylinder pressure does that piston traveling up create? Now, this is at low speeds, we'll say at cranking. Actually did a compression test on a C15, which is the first time I've ever done that this last week. It built around 450 PSI. Now I use PSI, not KPA or kilopascals because I'm in the United States. Yes, I understand the rest of the world does not use PSI generally, but that's what I'm familiar with. So you can convert the numbers to whatever you want. Anyway, PSI, pounds square inches. Now how much is 450 psi well, it's, it's a good amount of pressure that's uh, a truck tire generally runs around 100 psi so this is about four and a half times as much as a truck tire air pressure wise when the piston is moving up and it's compressing all the air in this area into this area it's building this pressure also all the heat that was in the air gets compressed also not only that all the air molecules getting compressed creates more heat so this also gets several hundred degrees Fahrenheit. That's the primer for a compression ignition engine. Now, like I said, air is not just gonna explode by itself. You have to add a fuel. What is this class? Diesel engine fuel systems. So this is where we are. Now we need to get fuel into the cylinder. Why are we getting fuel into the cylinder? Because you need to force this piston down with more pressure than it built here force it down harder to turn a crankshaft to do work. So we are primed air-wise to get into our first fuel system, right? Now we're gonna be brainstorming here and what we need to build a fuel system. 
So before we do that, we need to understand pressure. Pressure is so important to understand for fuel systems because that's what operates everything in the fuel system. If pressure wasn't a concept, you couldn't build a fuel system. We've already established some pressures here, but you need to understand that pressure is everywhere and controls lots of things. There's pressure in the room you're in. There's pressure in the room I'm in. Hey, you might be thinking, well, it's, I don't feel anything. Yes, so the air column, which goes all the way up to the top of our atmosphere, is forcing pressure upon us. That's why if you go to the mountains, you'll feel lightheaded. It's harder to breathe. There's less oxygen, there's less air pressure. Where I'm at, we're about 13 and a half PSI. So we're slightly above sea level. So in order to understand, we're gonna do a little experiment here. So I theorize that there is pressure in this room. How would we test that? Well, this water bottle, which is empty, well, it's not empty, there's actually air in it. There's no water in it though, has air in it. And the pressure inside and outside the bottle is the same because the cap's on. If you put the cap on, the pressure's still the same because you capped it with air in it. What if I pulled the air out of it? What do you think will happen? We already know what is gonna happen because pretty much everyone's done this experiment. You pull the air out of it, the water bottle collapsed, right? It's flat now. I didn't crush it. What caused that? The surrounding air pressure. You pulled the air out, so now you had relatively zero pressure inside and you had 14 PSI on the outside. That's what compressed it in. In order to expand it back out, you're gonna need to build enough pressure to re-bend the plastic. So, fixed it. Now, that's just a little experiment you can do with pressure, air pressure. But let's get back to our cylinder here. So, this system's already designed, but we need fuel to get into this cylinder, correct? Obviously. Without adding fuel, the rest of the system does, serves no purpose whatsoever. It's literally just taking energy to compress, unless you're building an air compressor, which it takes energy to compress air. You've just created a very complex machine that has no output. We need energy to be added to this system in order to force the piston down harder than the force it took to push it back up. So we need a way to get fuel into here. And do we want it sprayed in like a stream or do we want it kind of sprayed in like a mist? Well, you want it sprayed in as a mist. You need not only fuel in, pushed into the cylinder, but you don't want a solid stream. You want little, a little mist sprayed in and it needs to mix with the air. Now, of course the air is entire, it's not just a bubble, it's the entire cylinder's air. And you don't want it all sprayed into one side or all sprayed in one side, you kind of want it uniformly sprayed in. And you generally want it forced more towards the piston than to these corners, right? So how do you get it in there? We need a way to inject the fuel into the cylinder. So what you need is what we're gonna be discussing mostly. You need an injector. We're just gonna put INJ. So this goes into there. This injector is a very complex system, and the injector is the end of a very complex fuel system. Now, how much pressure does this injector need to build in order to even get in the cylinder? 200 PSI? No, would that work? That's a lot of pressure, 200 PSI. You can't even build one PSI in your lungs, but this is gonna build 200 PSI. Would it get into the cylinder? No. If you had a, if you had 200 PSI of pressure here, well, we'll say 200. When you open this valve, the air pressure, since it's already 450, is actually pushed back into the injector. You're not going to spray any fuel in. You need more than 450 PSI to get into the cylinder, so you'd need at least 451 PSI, right? Now. Since we got 450 and 451, what's the pressure differential? We have one PSI pressure differential. So you'll be literally spraying one PSI pressure into the cylinder. That's not enough to get really any volume of fuel or to atomize the fuel. 
I mean, your, your water pressure on the tap is 30 to 40 PSI, and you see how that comes out. You need hundreds or thousands of PSI to get not only into the cylinder, but to spray the fuel in and to atomize it properly. So this system needs to build lots of pressure in an instant to get into that cylinder, okay? That's the principle we're gonna be dealing with here. That's the very basis. So we've established the principles we need. Let's start theorizing and building our first way of injecting into the cylinder though. Now we're gonna start at the injector or nozzle, which we'll discuss, but that's kind of the end of the fuel system. And then we're gonna work our way back all the way to the fuel tank, which is where the fuel is stored. But we need to understand each component and why it's important first. So we already know we're trying to get fuel atomized, meaning is a mist, into the cylinder and it has to build a lot of pressure in order to even get into the cylinder. So you want as thin of an opening in the combustion chamber as possible. Remember your cylinder head's flat, it's exposed to the heat and the pressure of the combustion chamber, which is where all the compression and explosions happen. So you don't need a big quarter size area for where the fuel is injected in. You want to keep it as small as possible because that's, it'll keep expenses down and also you want to remove as much area as you can from the injector itself that's exposed to the combustion and the heat of the combustion process. So you're going to make generally what they look like is what they'll call, we'll call a pencil nozzle or a fuel injection nozzle. So it's going to be just a thin tube and generally they will kind of come to a taper where the cylinder is. Now we're going to say that this is the cylinder head that it's going through. So literally this whole area is the cylinder head. The injector is in the cylinder head. We'll just say this is the head, okay. And then of course you have your cylinder wall. So what you need to do in your injector is it needs to get fuel into it and it needs to be pressurized, correct? The problem with it is though, anytime you build pressure, it takes time to build. So what would happen, you now we need little holes for the fuel to come out. What would happen as you're building pressure in this injector or nozzle, whatever you want to call it. Well, as you're building pressure, and that pressure is higher than the pressure in here. Remember we have 450 PSI in here at the top of the compression stroke. So 450. And we need at least 451 inside to even start spraying into there. Well, as you increase in pressure, remember there's fuel in here. We'll just We'll just denote that fuel stored in here, which is not entirely accurate, but as fuel is building pressure in here, it would be trying to spray into here the entire time, right? It's, once it hits 451, it's gonna start to spray in here. We don't want that though. The reason you want that is one PSI differential is not gonna give you a nice atomization that you want. Not only, not only that, one PSI, you're not gonna be able to move very much fuel. When that piston's coming up, it's not stopping. It comes up, comes back down very rapidly. So you have to move, you have to build pressure very fast and you have to then spray a specific amount of fuel for what you want to do. If you're just idling an engine, it doesn't need that much fuel. If you're pulling a hill and pulling a trailer with 100,000 pounds and it's turbo spooled up to 30 PSI boost, you need a lot more fuel than you do at idling. So you need lots of pressure in here. How much pressure do you need in here to spray in there? Well, we're going to say it needs, we're going to pick a number. We're going to say 3,000 PSI. Now, that's a lot more than this. And that should give us enough to spray as much fuel as we want and do it in the blip of a second that we have when the piston's traveling up. Now, this number is not static. It's not always building 450 PSI. What do you think's happening when the engine RPMs are higher. It's warmed up. The engine's at 200 degrees Fahrenheit. It's at 2000 RPM. Not only that, it's got boost. Boost is forcing more air into the cylinder. 
we'll say 14 psi of boost. So now you've got not only the atmospheric pressure, but you've doubled that by adding 14 psi of boost additional. So this would be at least 900 psi, not counting the increase in RPM of the piston and everything else. So 3000 should keep us way above whatever the cylinder pressures are before combustion. So that's why fuel systems, if you've ever noticed, need lots of pressure. Now, is this pressure constant in all fuel systems? No, that could be low in pretty much most fuel systems, really. Most fuel systems are gonna run slightly higher pressure than that. Common rail systems, which we're not gonna be getting into this video, we'll get into that into the advanced fuel systems uh, video, which should be the next video. They get way above that, how high? Easily past 30,000 plus PSI. Now they run the highest pressures, but we'll get into why they do that. But you can, you can't really have too, I mean, you can have too much pressure. Obviously you don't need 400 billion PSI. For one thing, that's pretty much impossible to make. The inject, nothing could withstand that pressure. There's a sweet spot. Several thousand PSI up into the tens of thousands are basically what we're looking for. Like I said, you need to understand pressure. So let's just work with our 3000 PSI as a number. So you need to build 3000 PSI in the system. But like I said, you can't just, remember it takes time to build pressure. If once you established it's over 451 PSI, it's gonna be injecting, you don't want that. You need this to fire the very right time when the piston's coming up. If you fire before the piston's at the top of the compression stroke, that's too advanced. And what will happen is you'll actually be igniting before the piston gets to the top. You'll be working against the piston coming up. You don't want to do that. You need to time this very specific time. Also, you need a way of keeping pressure in here to only release at a certain pressure. So generally, nozzles are going to have some sort of poppet valve that when as this pressure increases, we'll just denote that with a tack. Um, so this is our swing on our tack. It needs to get to, let's say here, which is 3000 PSI. As this builds pressure, when it gets to here, it needs to force fuel into the cylinder. So how does it do that? Well, generally with a valve and a spring. It'll feed fuel into this poppet valve, which this then goes to here, that when it is supplied fuel, remember this is not our fuel tank, this is our nozzle. This is fed fuel. When this valve gets to this pressure, it lifts this spring up. Does that make sense? So you have basically like a valve and a cylinder head, you're going to have a valve here. It's going to have fuel seated against this with a spring. Now they are more complicated than this, but this is the same function. It's going to hold here until this reaches 3000 PSI. When it can overcome the pressure of this valve spring or this nozzle spring, it's not a valve spring. This is a valve spring, but in the illustration, when it can compress that, which means it reached this pressure, it'll spray in the cylinder. And since this is way more than this, it's gonna spray and it should atomize, especially if everything's clean and running properly. That is the principle of a nozzle, a fuel nozzle. Now, there's a lot more going on in the fuel nozzle than just a single poppet valve. And these pressures, like I said, are not uniform. They can have varying pressures for when they open and close and all this stuff. But that's the principle you need to understand. This is predominantly how fuel systems and diesel engines work before the electronic age. And this is, like I said, the end of the line. This is where fuel gets sprayed in. Now we need to work our way back. How does fuel get into the nozzle? Like I said, this is not your fuel tank. Nozzles are tiny. They're like the size of a pencil. But your fuel tank holds hundreds of gallons of fuel. So you need to get the fuel from the fuel tank into the nozzle. Not only that, the nozzle is dumb. All it does is it has a little valve and pressure is supplied to it. Now, what if pressure was supplied to it all the time? 3,000 PSI was supplied to it all the time. 
Well, this spring, all it knows is 3,000 PSI open. If it had 3,000 PSI going to it all the time, what would happen? It would be spraying fuel all the time at all parts of the four-stroke combustion process. Do you want that? Of course you don't want that. You only want it to spray at a very specific time, but the nozzle doesn't set when it sprays. The nozzle just gets pressure and sprays fuel. So now we need to work our way back to the most complicated part next. So we have our nozzle. We're done discussing the nozzle. We will get into injectors and different fuel systems, but as far as the nozzle goes, we need to get past, we need to get into earlier parts of the fuel system. Now, of course, fuel system starts at the fuel tank. That's where you give all of your money to the fuel station and put fuel into the tank. So that gets filled up. I don't think we need to really illustrate a lot of a fuel tank. It's literally just a container that holds fuel in it. But there's some stuff going on between the two here. So like we said, the nozzle is not smart. It does not supply its own fuel. The tank supplies the fuel, but it has to get to there. We also said that the nozzle does not determine at what point pressure is built in the system. So this has to be supplied with fuel. So you have a fuel line that runs from the injector nozzle to something else. Now what is that something else? Now we're not discussing electronic engines in particular in this video. We're discussing mechanical engines. Now we're going to be discussing the more complicated electronic fuel systems later, but there's what we're going to talk about, the pump. A pump is something that moves fluid and that's what this one does. However, unlike a hydraulic pump or an oil pump or a water pump, this is by far the most expensive complicated piece of technology on a diesel engine before the advent of electronic injectors and stuff. And this is going to be your high pressure fuel pump. So we're just going to draw it as a box and then we're going to discuss at least how one of the systems works, at least the one I'm most familiar with. Now, do you have to have a high pressure fuel pump in order to make high pressure in the nozzle? No, you don't. And we'll discuss that next, but this is our pump. The pump does a lot. Whoever designed these, very intelligent people. So the pump, like I said, it's what produces the flow and creates the fuel flow for the nozzle. It, it has to do this very rapidly. So it has to be built with very expensive sensitive components. It has to also determine how much fuel it's going to send to the nozzle. So this pump has to determine when it has to also determine how much. So this has to determine when and how much fuel is injected into the nozzle. It also has to have something that connects between the nozzle and the pump itself. Those are just steel fuel lines generally. And this, for these illustrations, of course, this is a single cylinder. Most engines are not single cylinders. They're going to be a four cylinder, a six, or an eight, or a 12, or 16, whatever. Six being the most common diesel engine cylinder, at least in truck engines. So this pump, without electronics, has to determine when and how much fuel gets sent to the nozzle. Not only that, generally you're dealing with more than one nozzle. We'll say six. It has to do that on each of the nozzles. So how does it do that? That is the most complicated question we're going to be answering in this video. When does it do it and how much? This is going to be complicated and hopefully this information relays well. From my brain to here to your brain. This is everything we're going to discuss in here is going to be inside of this high pressure fuel pump. Okay, so remember we already got a fuel line going to the nozzle. We've got fuel coming into the fuel pump from the tank. How do we create pressure and determine how much fuel has traveled to that nozzle. Well, there's two components inside of the high pressure fuel pump. And this is, like I said, there are different style high pressure fuel pumps. This is the most common the one I'm familiar with. You're gonna have what they call a pump, not the high pressure fuel pump, but an individual pump. Some people call them a plunger. It looks kind of like a lifter, a, uh, a hydraulic flat tappet lifter if you're familiar with what those look like. But basically it's in a it's in a cylinder, kind of like your piston is, that is filled with fuel, not oil. And I don't mean air either. It's literally full of fuel. 
fuel is, we're going to denote that it's full here, it's full here. And it is traveling this plunger, which is the, roughly the same size as the cylinder itself, here. And it goes up and down just like a piston would. But it is attached to our fuel line, which runs out to our nozzle through here. And it needs to determine how much fuel is forced into the nozzle. How does it do that? Well, it's got two controls. One is not adjustable and one is adjustable. But first, what, what forces it up and down? Could it be a crankshaft? It could be. You could make a crankshaft somewhat like this. The problem with the crankshaft that has a connecting rod it complicates things. Uh, what they actually use is a camshaft, which has lobes. So of course a lobe, okay, we're gonna, we're gonna extend this down slightly. Cam lobe is going to ride along this plunger. Remember, cam lobe is like an egg shape, so it rotates, which is going to force this up and down. That is where you get your timing. When this is forced up on the top of the cam lobe, that forces fuel inside the plunger to push out and go through the fuel line into our nozzle, which is over here. But remember, it does two things, when and how much. This is the when. The cam lobe, which is mechanical. It's solid. You can't change it. Determines the when. Now, the cam is generally attached to something called a timing advance. So, the when can be slightly advanced or retarded as far as the timing of the fuel system inside the fuel pump. But the actual cam lobe itself, nothing can move. Nothing can move it. It's going to rotate and push the plunger up and down every rotation. There's something else called a rack. And the rack is what the, this is very, a complex system to understand, but there's a, a metal connection here called the rack that generally goes to something inside the pump or bolt onto the pump called the governor. You've probably heard of this before if you worked on older diesel engines, but the governor generally has, let's say, a scroll, a, an armature that runs to the plunger that has a scroll system. And you need to see it work, but as you twist this plunger or the scroll system, it moves this so that only certain amounts of fuel, let's say this is our fuel supply here, Let's say it's here. So that's a very small chamber. That would be like an idle. This is our, remember, this is not movable, but this is. So the plunger is going up, but it can also spin. The spinning is what gives you the amount of fuel. Remember, it's when and how much. When, how much. How much is determined by the governor? The governor is mechanically the most complicated system in the fuel system because this is just a camshaft. The governor has springs and fly weights and tons of different settings to determine how much fuel each plunger is going to build or how much fuel each plunger is going to send to the nozzle. Um, where is too much fuel? What is too little fuel? When to shut off? Stuff like that. So let's say this moves this way, which would move this scroll from here this would move this way, so it would be similar to having the, the supply line move to here, which is obviously that's a bigger channel, so we have more fuel. Is this exactly how it works? It's how the principle works. So, but the governor controls how much fuel by moving the rack. The rack will then send more or less fuel to the plunger, and the cam will tell it when to fire. That's what's going on inside of the high-pressure fuel pump. Remember, this is all inside the high-pressure fuel pump and then it goes, supplies it to the nozzle. Okay, now remember I said there are two kinds of mechanical fuel systems before the electronic advent. 
And we were discussing the one that uses nozzles. So the nozzles are cheap. The high pressure fuel pump is very expensive. Can you think of a way of getting rid of the nozzles and the high pressure fuel pump, but still getting fuel into the cylinders? You'd still need pressure. You'd still need a way of telling how much fuel and when to fire, right? Well, this is a different system that worked and an electronic version of st is still used today. And this is what they call a MUI fuel system, which is mechanical unit injector. And as far as the cylinder and the engine itself is concerned, it's identical. But the actual fuel system itself is much different. It has advantages and disadvantages, just like pretty much everything, but let's get into them. So everything else in the engine is identical. So the first thing that's different, we're gonna start at the end, is instead of a nozzle, as I said, it's a unit injector. So a unit injector, instead of the nozzle, which was, of course the nozzles generally are small, thin, right, it's right into the cylinder, that's a nozzle. Unit injector generally is much larger and more expensive. And it will generally have a larger body and then it's going to have some sort of apparatus coming off of it that controls for how much fuel and then it generally is also going to have a flat area on top and it's also going to have a spring built into it. This is one component. Instead of this, which might be $80, this might be $300. But why? What? Why? Why not run these? These are cheaper. These require a high pressure fuel system to supply them the fuel and to tell them when to fire. These build up the pressure inside of them and also determine when to fire. And for how much fuel? Wow, well that's cool, that does a lot more than these. Like I said, advantages and disadvantages, but these are more expensive than these. However, these have a high pressure fuel system that supplies them. These don't. Is there a better system? I would say not. Um, each has its advantages and disadvantages. We need to discuss how this system works now. So, forget the nozzle for now. This one, same as the other one, is exposed to our combustion cycle. So we're installed into the cylinder head here. We'll say this is the cylinder head, this area here. This is the cylinder. We have 450 PSI here of pressure. We still need to build. We're gonna use that same number. 3000 PSI needs to be built here. Irritating, I didn't do my work. Okay. Okay. So this part's the same. Why is this different? So, what determines how much fuel gets sprayed in? Well, which, what determines it on the high pressure fuel pump? The rack and the governor, right? So, what's this little armature here? This comes off of the injector. This is an injector, not a nozzle. This will go to a bar that usually will run through the cylinder head of valve cover base or something. And that's going to go outside of the cylinder head to, guess what? A governor! This governor is still connected by this linkage to the rack, but the rack is not inside a high pressure fuel pump. It's inside the injector itself. So it has, like we said, kind of that kind of a scroll system where depending on where the scroll is, obviously the whole injector doesn't move in this position, but there is a movable component inside where the scroll is fed. Wherever the fuel supply is fed to in this system determines how much fuel. So you have how much fuel being determined by the governor, but what about the when? 
Remember, when and how much is what's important in the fuel system. Well, there's a spring up here, so obviously that needs to get pushed down somehow by something. And here's where this system gets more complicated. So instead of this being externally fed high pressure, this has to get pushed down by something. Now these are sitting on top of the cylinder head. So what's gonna push down on it? The crankshaft, uh, the dipstick. Now, something that spins and pushes down, guess what's next to these here? Is what's gonna push the spring down here. Remember this is sitting over your uh, cylinder head where you have your valves going into the cylinder head and take an exhaust valve and they have little springs too. What are, what are pushing these downs? down? Well, there's rocker arms that feed off of the camshaft. So depending on if you have a camshaft with a push rod, no matter what, you're gonna have some sort of armature that's going to be fed off of the camshaft. This is a pivot point. Be bigger than that. It's going to force downward pressure onto this spring. The force of this downward pressure as this spring is compressed is where you get your pressure, your 3000 PSI. So the camshaft itself, let's say it's a push rod cam. So this has a push rod, it goes into the engine, and of course then there's your cam lobe. Remember the plungers on the other high pressure fuel system? It had cam lobes too. This just uses the same cam that's also pushing down on our intake and exhaust valve to push down on our, our mechanical unit injector. So it pushes down, creates pressure. It also is determining when, because the cam lobe pushes down at a specific time. So that determines our when and creates our pressure. Our governor to an external linkage determines how much fuel gets sprayed into the cylinder. Mechanical unit injector. Governor is external. There's no high pressure fuel pump. Uh, you might be wondering though, where, how does fuel get into this system? That's a good question. So we didn't determine on the high pressure fuel pump how fuel got in there, but in a fuel system, there's gonna be something called a fuel transfer pump. A fuel transfer pump, generally, all it does is it pulls fuel from your fuel tank through filter and into the high pressure fuel pump. This doesn't have a high pressure fuel pump, so it'll still have a fuel transfer pump. Generally, these are ran off of the governor itself because the governor's ran off of usually the gear train in the front of the engine and it'll pull fuel from the fuel tank through filters and then generally into the cylinder head itself. So there'll be little ports with fittings feeding to the cylinder head. Remember, this is our cylinder head, this area here. And it'll have a hose that runs, I don't know where to draw this, but basically there'll be a hose that connects to a port that runs to each of the injectors and it'll supply fuel pressure. How much fuel pressure? Not a lot. We'll just say 50 PSI. So remember, it just needs fed a good constant low amount of fuel pressure to the injector itself. The injector, when it needs high pressure, 3000 PSI, it is forced from the rock room itself. That is how a mechanical unit injector system works. Also, we covered how a nozzled High pressure fuel pump system works. Got it? That is the basic for diesel engine fuel systems. Now it gets a lot more complicated, but somewhat simpler when we get into the electronic side, which of course this video is also already very long. But now you understand the simp not simple, the principles of diesel engine fuel systems and how they function. Be sure to check the next video where we're going to discuss mechanical electronic unit unit injectors, Huey systems, and common rail systems and how they operate. All right, thanks for watching.